Welcome to class to this Deep Learning Fall 2022 edition, 5 p.m. almost, uh, 14th episode. What are we talking about today? First of all, actually, actually, before we start talking about the class, so I can, you know, get some minutes waiting for your classmates to come to class, right? For who is a bit late today. Uh, I just found out, well, actually, I knew about this before, but I never actually um, uh, use it because I'm talking about tools, right? Uh, sometimes. So to, to make my slides, I use something called LaTeX-It uh, from a friend of mine uh, who, I forgot the name, but so, <laughs> such a bad friend I am, right? Uh, but it's it's for Mac, at least for what I know. And then you can drag and drop these formulas you made in LaTeX and you drop, drag them in a PowerPoint that you can animate everything. But then it's always drag and back and forth which is maybe fine Then you can animate things. As you can see in my slides, I think are, things are pretty cute. But unfortunately, what happens if you have to update your formulas? Let's say because you change notation every semester, I update my notation and the big pain in the uh, uh, neck is the fact that I cannot update all the formulas based on my new notation, right? Uh, if you if you just use LaTeX, you have one preamble. You can define symbols in the preamble, and then everything cascades throughout the compilation. Right, whenever you uh, include that preamble, so just update the preamble, everything is going to be updated. That's why someone could say Beamer is a good thing, although it's a horrible thing, I believe. But that's my opinion. Um, so I just figured there is this thing that works wonderfully, uh, Iguana LaTeX. Uh, so this thing here. So this is actually a plugin for PowerPoint that works for both Windows and Mac, Mac and Windows, right? Um, and you can just write basically LaTeX, you generate and so on. Uh, the translation is wrong. Bitmap here means a PDF, portable document format, not a raster. And the other thing that I just figured today is that here you can just do include, well, actually uh, input, and they can, you can add your um, preamble. And now all your formulas are going to be depending on this preamble. Like you, you can update just once and all the formulas will be, uh, you know, following that major uh, template, right? It's like uh, HTML and the, the CSS file, right? The style files. So I think this is just great. And it works for both Windows and Mac. And, but the major point is that everything is, can be defined in this external file you can um, you can use as a, like a template, right? Also, there is an extra button here, I think, now that you can edit your uh, source file in an external um, editor, which could also have auto-completion based on the inputs. So if you have a preamble, then this external editor, if he actually reads the LaTeX and imports the preamble, it can also automatically auto-complete your things. And then if, you, if it's also able to, uh, generate LaTeX, you also can do like some preview, right? I think this is just great because afterwards you can apply all your animations and things and then nothing, uh, you just have to do once, right? You don't have to do things too many times. Anyway, this is enough. We, are, we wait enough for people to come to class. We start with the lesson today, okay? So that was small bonus at the beginning of class. So we are in the middle of understanding these energy-based models, right? We spent the last two classes, I think, if not more on that kind of ellipsy thing, right? So we're going to be actually starting off from there such that we can make connections to the new topic, right? So the following topic is going to be finally giving you all the view, right? Uh, about these models, right? So we finally, uh, since we build all those little tiny, uh, you know, building blocks, right? We started first with the energy interpretation of the classification, right? That was easy peasy because you already know how to perform classification. Then we move into this latent variable uh, energy energy based model inference, and then we spend some time in the training uh, for learning the parameters. Uh, and we understood that uh, these latent variables allow us to produce infinitely many uh, predictions, right? So whenever we have to learn a one-to-many mapping, then I can use this latent variable in order to be able to, uh, you know, predict all possible values, right? Uh, if you only can predict one value and there are multiple targets which are far apart, then you can, the best guess is going to be just predicting the average uh, of them, right? And which 
is not always the best option, right? As we have seen uh, when we had the ellipse, if you predict the average of an ellipse, you're going to get the point in the center, which is not any possible point, right? There is no possibility, right? The points are around, right? There is not in the center. The same way if you're driving your car and sometimes you take to the right, sometimes you take, take turn to the left when you have the intersection, turn to the right, turn to the left, left, right. And if you train a model which doesn't have latent variables, right? And you don't tell it in advance in what direction you're going to be turning, it's going to be learning to go where? just straight ahead, which is not the best thing you want to do, right? Because, you know, you might incur into some problems, right? If the straight splits into, you may want to take one or the other option. I spent the day making new slides yesterday and today, right? So you're going to get something new that hasn't been taught before, which means new material. I, uh, primate, no, what's the word in English? Um, uh, help me out. Come on. Yeah, yes, you are my guinea pig that, that we established already. Uh, so you're going to have exclusive, oh, there you go, exclusive content for you, right? Just because you are uh, in class this semester. You have exclusive content, which we don't necessarily know if it's going to work, right? Because all the animations, you know, you will figure right today if they work. All right, so uh, unconditional learning, generative models, right? So. Remember what was the unconditional conditional thing? Let's uh, remind a little bit ourselves what we are talking about, right? Because also the notation in this course is slightly different from other courses, right? Uh, so we try to, you know, to fix broken things around. Uh, so remember we had the data, which is this kind of pill. We divided it in three circles, the pink, the blue, and the uh, orange, right? This data is, uh, cut in two parts. The left side is always, always visible, right? Always observed. And the right hand side is never observed, right? Uh, then we uh, also use this kind of shading, um, you know, uh, feeling, right? In order to be distinguishing when you have or not have the blue guy, right? So the pink is going to be always shaded. The uh, orange is going to be always unshaded because it's never been seen. But then the Y, depending uh, when you have it, is going to be one or the other, right? Which one are the two cases? When are you observing the targets? We observe the targets during... Type, 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 come on. <laughs> during training, yes, of course, right? So we have these X, which are the observations. We have the Y, Ys are the target, the things that we want to learn, right? And so the Ys are always there because that's what we care, right? And then this Z over there, which we have seen that they are hidden, they can be inferred, we have no access to them, we can just, you know, but they allow us to have this kind of uh, parameterization of the output, right? I can change my output by changing these uh, Zs. Cool. Um, those are optional and also the X's are optional, right? So today we're going to be talking about unconditional learning. Guess what it's going to be about? It's going to be about learning. Finish my sentence. Learning unconditionally, of course, without the X, right? That, that's the point, right? We always want to learn something. The only thing we learn is going to be the Y, right? You can learn the Y given that you observe an X. You just learn the Y without observing anything, okay? And Y can be anything, right? Today is going to be um, points, I believe. Tomorrow is going to be images, but whatever, okay? We start with points because it's easier to, <laughs> to draw on the screen. Uh, once more, so what are these names? All right, so we have the inputs are X, which is observed during training and testing. The Y is observed only during training, as you said correctly. And then you have that Z is never observed. Uh, finally, on the other side, we have the outputs. Perhaps you have the uh, green, green ball H, that is the internal or hidden representation. This is not the latent, right? Latent means missing, right? Like the Z, the Z is the missing uh, variable. Uh, then we have the Y tilde. Again, this is the approximation of the target, okay? And the tilde means more or less, right? Circa, like circa 1500 century, right? More or less. Okay, so last week we covered this guy over here, right? 
Uh, it's dim. Yes, I know the, the, your screen is not broken. The, the, the brightness is lower because it's already seen material, right? So you don't have to pay too much attention. And this is our energy model, latent variable energy model, which allows us to generate that cone in the output. Okay. And this was the conditional, right? This is the conditional predict predictor, right? Mm -hmm. The conditional prediction we is obtained by using the predictor, which tells us the curvature and the extension of the ellipse, right? And then the decoder basically just makes things go around uh, ellipses in this case, okay? Again, this was the conditional, which means we observe the X location. But then the, uh, we started the lesson with the unconditional, right? So we started the lesson without that first thing and we defined this energy, right? So this was the first time we introduced the energy as the major architectural component, right? So we define the model here by defining the energy. Whereas when we were talking about the classifier, we were trying to uh, see where the energy can be somehow defined after the model is already put in place, right? Instead here, we just define the energy model starting from the energy itself. Okay, all good. All right, moving on, starting today's lesson. By revising uh, the technique we use for training any energy-based model, okay? So we start with this item over here, but uh, remember what was the last slide in the last lab, right? We were talking about the fact that we don't necessarily know what is the size of Z. More precisely, Z doesn't have to be a scalar value, okay? Z was one dimensional in that case because my Y's were two dimensional points, right? And then anything that is larger than one dimension gives me too much information. What happens if my Z is, let's say, two dimensional? I think I asked you the same question at the end of the class, but perhaps someone left. Do you remember? If you have Z that is one dimensional, how do we perform inference in this thing? If I have a point, right? Let's say I have this point over here where my hand is, right? I'd like to estimate. I'd like to, to, to estimate its free energy. What was the free energy? Can let's re, re, revise, right? In, in geometric terms, right? So we, like just intuitive speaking, right? What was the free energy? The free energy was the dot, dot, dot to the closest point of the dot, 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 right? Mm. So that is the minimum distance to the manifold. There you go, that you're correct, okay? So given that is my Y here, my, my target, I check what is the distance between all points on the manifold. I look at the closest distance and then I check what is the squared, uh, squared Euclidean distance, that's my free energy, right? So that's the closest way to the manifold, right? And the closer you are to the manifold and the lower you are gonna be uh, having your energy, right? Meaning that that point, it's likely to be coming from the data distribution, the data manifold, right? If instead the energy is very large, that means your Y is very, very, very far away and, you know, too bad, it's far. It's not coming probably from the data manifold, right? Here, we are going to be generalizing this, right? So one of the last slides uh, we covered last time, we were mentioning the fact that Z can be a vector, okay? So in the case of the ellipse, right? What happens if Z is two-dimensional now? How were we finding, right? So the collapse, right? What does collapse mean? Energy is zero everywhere, right? So what what does it mean that the energy is zero uh, everywhere? So by changing the latent variable, we were going around a one-dimensional sub-manifold, right? A one-dimensional manifold embedded in the ambient space, which is this two-dimensional space, okay? Now the problem is that if you are on a 2D manifold on a two-dimensional space, then you can reach everywhere, right? I mean, you're, you're, you're covering the whole thing, right? So only... In, in the in the case we saw last week was the like the fact that we were only existing you know our prediction are allowed only to move around a one dimensional manifold that was enough to avoid having the ability to reach every location in the 2d space right unless you start you know <laughs> covering the whole uh, the whole space right okay so how can we avoid collapse right how can we avoid 
to have zero everywhere or otherwise how can we avoid y tilde to be too much uh, too free right meaning how how do we fight the every possible motion of y right so we have to add some, okay add some constraints or some regularization where we are adding where are we adding the regularization we're going to be adding this regularization to the z right and so these are for regularizer basically allows us to uh, start paying a price if z changes you know outside a specific range of values right or it's proportional to the i don't know length of the of the vector itself something like that okay 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 we are on the on the same page so training recap given a observation right given a, a global y and given a energy function e of y and z in this case remember the energy is given to us by the sum of all the boxes right so in this case it's going to be c the cost plus r the regularizer where y tilde is going to be the decoded version the decoded uh, latent variable we were computing the energy f as the softer minimum soft mean of the energy itself right remember we were taking that kind of uh, that integral or the summation if z is discrete by paying attention to remember what which were which were the more important terms in that soft mean e is going to be a vector or a function right which of the values like large or small values of e contribute the most to the uh, final soft mean the smallest right so again the soft mean uh, gives you like some sort of uh, summary about the lowest value of the energy or if you make it hard just takes the, the smallest value uh, itself right and then we were minimizing that loss right and that loss functional in order to have a well-behaved energy function which is giving low energy to points that are coming from the training uh, training set okay okay uh, then let's clear up the screen and we're going to be going to the zero temperature limit. So your zero, zero temperature limit, you just increase the coldness, right? You increase the, uh, you make it super cold, but you, you stick it in the, in the freezer. And then in this case, we are computing the arg, uh, arg mean, like the Z check, which is the latent variable that gives me the prediction closest to the target, right? And then I can compute the free energy, which was the minimum distance. And then we were minimizing this loss function, right? For the zero temperature limit free energy. Okay. So let's have a final concrete example of a, you know, uh, energy-based model that is a little bit more you know, serious than the toy example we saw last time. Okay. And so we're going to be talking about K-means. Whoa. <laughs> so K-means, yes, is a generative model. Mm. Okay, this is going to be interesting, right? Perhaps you haven't heard about that uh, in this, like you haven't heard about k-means in these terms. So actually there, instead of having the regularization term, we're going to have a constraint, right? So it's going to be like a hard constraint rather than a softer constraint. In this case, Z is one of the columns of the k-dimensional identity matrix. Okay, so Z is going to be a one hot a uh, vector of size capital K. That's where the K comes in the K means, right? So capital K means it's not lowercase K means, right? <laughs> anyway, uh, Y tilde is the output of the decoder, which is going to be simply a rotation of my latent variable. And then if you multiply a matrix by a one hot vector, what do we get? Remember when you have matrix vector multiplication. <laughs> oh my God, I don't want to even <laughs> say this. Well, okay. So whenever you have matrix vector multi multiplication, that means that you take the first column of the matrix and you scale it by the first component in the vector. Then you have a plus, you have the second column of the matrix scaled by the second scalar in the vector, right? Uh, plus the third column of the matrix multiply you know scale by the third component and so on right so you need to have as many scaling factor in, in your vector as the number of columns right now the thing is that if that scaling factors are all zero the sum of all of these things is going to be zero if ju there is just one non-zero element which is equal one you basically extract that specific column okay i hope it makes sense right i like to see 
uh, every you know matrix vector multiplication can be seen from different angles. Uh, this summation of scaled columns is going to be the one that works very well to quickly uh, think about these things, right? Again, if you already knew and I'm offending you because you're already knowledgeable, then sorry. But I think it's important to be able to, uh, that everyone has the ability to imagine these things uh, on the fly. All right. And then the final thing is going to be the, the energy which is going to be the cost because there is the only single box there. It's going to be the square Euclidean distance. So the same thing as last week. Okay. We choose uh, the L to be the energy loss, right? So the energy loss means that the per sample loss uh, functional is going to be the value of the free energy itself. Okay. All right, cool. So in this case, I have 50 training sample in a 2D space which are going to be uh, the following. So these are going to be my, uh, my training samples. Okay. I have 50 points in a 2D space. No, no big deal. Right. Okay. So then let's figure how to perform inference. Okay. So I have E, I just compute the pairwise distance, right? Between my, all my points Y, right? Which are 50 against all the columns of this matrix. Okay. How many columns do we have? In this case, I have, I have 15 columns. So capital K, I should have written perhaps somewhere. I have, I chose, I've chosen capital K equal 15. So this instruction here, bam, one line computes the E. Then I can compute F and Z check in one instruction line, right? Uh, I didn't tell you about uh, where W was. Okay. I'll tell you in a second. Uh, y over on the right hand side, right? Y is 50 times two. Okay. Okay. No, no, don't apologize. Just, you can ask anything. <laughs> anyway, second line of code, we already finished with K means, uh, almost uh, there are three line of code. I mean, this is very simple, uh, to, to, to write down in PyTorch. So if you type E dot mean, and then you say the rightmost dimension, right? 15, you end up with 50 values for F. So F is a vector of 50 dimensions and Z check is also going to be a vector of 50 dimensions uh, with the index corresponding to which uh, is the closest column vector, right? So W is also called a dictionary. Okay. Maybe a dumb question, but can you use other loss function rather than square loss for K means? So it's not the loss, right? I think you're, 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 you're asking whether I, I, you can change the cost. Uh, are you, are you saying that, right? Although you wrote loss, but I understand that you're saying cost, right? There are two different things, right? The choice of loss is the right most. I choose the loss to be equal the energy itself. That's one of the choices to implement K means. The other choice is to use the square Euclidean, Euclidean distance for the cost, the penalty. Okay. Yeah, yeah, sure. You can swap here, whatever you want, right? Uh, we are just checking <laughs> how to cast and, and see K means from the energy perspective. Okay. So again, like in the classifier, you're already aware of how this stuff works. I'm not teaching you K means. I'm just showing you how to see K means as a generative energy based model. Okay. Latent variable energy based model. Cool. Makes sense. Yes. I hope so. Moving on. <laughs> I mean, I don't want to, uh, I mean, this is not a lesson on K-means. I'm just showing you how K-means is seen from this perspective. Okay. Anyway, good questions. Don't, don't stop the questions. The, uh, on this line here, I compute the free energy and the Z check in one line, right? By just doing E dot mean, right? E being this tensor, right? This torch tensor. And then this mean returns two items, right? And again, F and Z check are going to be 50 items, right? Because what is this instruction doing? Well, this instruction is taking the minimum of these 15 distances, right? So how to read this line here per each Y in this capital Y, there are 15 W's, right? And so each row of this E matrix basically tells you what are the 15 square distances, right? Of one Y towards all the W's, right? So it's the same thing we were talking with this manifold, right? You have one Y instead of having infinitely many points on the, on the, on the, 
on the ellipse, now you had just 15 points, right? Pam, 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 pam. You can think about just discretizing your uh, ellipse in just 15 points, which exactly was, again, what we were doing. We were doing a different discretization, but eventually I, I did discretize the thing, right? Although you could do the continuous version. All right, so uh, this F is gonna be a vector of 50 elements, one per each Y, right? So each Y in your training set has a free energy, and then each Y has a Z check, which is telling you which of the centroids was the closest. Finally, for K that goes from one to capital K, you simply assign that each column is going to be the mean of the training samples for which the index corresponds to the given uh, column, okay? And again, you have one, two, three, four lines and you have k-means, okay? There is one more line. So if you repeat this, uh, let's say a bunch of times, right? Through a few, a few epochs, then you basically train your system. Uh, until it converges, right? You always, uh, you, this, you're basically doing gradient descent here. And how to initialize this W? A W can be initialized by picking uh, 15 random training samples, for example. Okay. Uh, so the check has the indexes of the closest means, well, the closest centroid. But what does F contain again? Well, F. If you compute, if you type e something dot mean, right, in torch, mean gives you the minimum value, right? So e was the set of uh, 15 distances, square distances, right, per each training point. If you take the mean, min, right, you're going to get the shortest distance. So the shortest distance, f, is telling you what is the closest distance to the manifold. But now the manifold is defined by discrete points, right? Whereas before it was the subspace, right? Now the manifold is descri described as, you know, uh, single discrete points in the ambient space. Got it. So why do you need F for this computation? F is the output of the model. F tells me how far my Y is to the, well, like what, how, what is the closest distance to the manifold, right? So the inference here, right? The, the thing we care is going to be determining the energy, the, the free energy for a sample. You would like to know whether this sample is reasonable or it's not. This is a generative model because my model spits out the closest centroid, okay? So if you return W of Z check, right? then that's actually my, my output, right? So I, maybe I should have written here one extra line. Does it make sense? So let's say I have a, after I train the system, right? I have one, one new Y, right? I have the new Y, and then I can compute what is the free energy for that new Y, you know? And also I can tell what is going to be the prediction and the prediction is gonna be the closest centroid to my new target. Are we on the same page? Is Z check zero or one? Z check is going to be a vector, a one hot vector, right? Or in this case, it's going to be the index of the uh, non zero element, right? In this uh, first mathematical representation, Z check was the one hot vector. In the code here, in the PyTorch version, Z check is actually the index, okay? And so it's the index of the non zero component. Okay. How does the energy landscape uh, look? Well, let's have a look. Let's, let's, let's check. So these were my training points, right? I showed you before. There are 50 points in a two dimensional space. And these are going to be, uh, this is going to be the free energy, right? The uh, zero temperature limit free energy. If your Y location happens to be at any of the coordinates you see here at any of these centroids, then the energy is going to be zero, right? As you move away from the centroids, then the energy increases quadratically, right? And you can see this, right? Maybe you don't see it here very well. So let me show you the next slide. Instead of showing you all values from 0 to 1.6, right? I show you things that are from 0 0.02 to 0 0.01 or 0 0.10, okay? So this is very, very close to the, to the bottom of that thing. 
And I show you here some curve levels, right? Such that you can see around each of these one, or you have like these little rings and then this stuff grows up uh, parabolically, okay? Questions about these things so far? Okay, so far, I think I'm doing well, right? Let me know if what you think afterwards. All right, so moving on, second, oh, okay, sorry. Could you say again, what the model consists of here? Uh, this is the model. You have a latent variable, you have a decoder. The decoder is linear. There is only a W matrix. And there is a square Euclidean distance used for cost. That's the model itself, right? And the energy based model, well, the energy thing is going to be like a box here around everything, right? Which has Y and Z sticking out. Are we good? Okay. All right, so back to the uh, zero temperature limit uh, we, we covered before, right? The, the recap. So the, the first example I showed you was these k-means, right? Let's see another example that used this exact same recipe, okay? So in this case, we're going to be talking about sparse coding. Any difference? Just a title, okay? So one slide uh, for title change. But of course, there are going to be some, some details, right? So the main, main structure is going to be exactly the same. That's why you have two identical slides. There are going to be some additional uh, contributions, right? To have some, uh, we have to introduce the sparsity, right? What does sparse mean? We already talked about sparsity when we were talking about convolutional nets, but let's have uh, now another instance of this utilization of sparsity in, uh, in, in deep learning, okay? So here we have that the decoder, First of all, it's going to be linear, okay? So as for the uh, k-means, also in the sparse coding, we have this linear decoder. The cost is going to be as for the k-means, this square Euclidean distance, right? We also have this r, right? In the, in the k-means, r was not there, and we had this kind of hard constraint. Now we have a softer constraint, so r is going to be this softer term and r is going to be alpha scalar coefficient the one norm of set okay I, I compute everything that is written here and i try to minimize right let's have a look at the energy i i learned by performing this okay for the same training points i showed you before so if you do that you're gonna get this how would you describe this uh picture Uh, it's a cone. It's a cone with some linear parts. I don't know if you can see, right? So there is like a horizontal part here. There is an oblique part. There is a vertical part. There is like a. There are sharp edges. Yes, there you go. Thank you. Uh, it doesn't capture the spiral very well. I think it doesn't capture the spiral at all. Okay, <laughs> but you're very kind uh, to say just not very well. Uh, see, so this thing doesn't really work. The, I see some large energy uh, locations here in this kind of little uh, slice, more yellow things here. But basically, you have just a darker region uh, near where the majority of the points are, and then this stuff just grows as you uh, as you as you climb uh, as you go away from this location. Actually, this model had a bias uh, as well in the decoder, such that you can have the darker region associated uh, to having a z equals zero over here, okay? So what you're seeing here is that whenever you have z equals zero, then you're at this location over here, which is going to be equal to the bias, right? So if you're on this slide, if you're in this slide, and I told you there is a bias as well, now for that, that uh, visualization. So if you have z equals zero, you end up having y tilde being the bias term, right? And so you end up over here. And then as you start increasing z, you basically measure on the right hand side what is going to be the length of z, okay? That's pretty much all it happens, all, it, all, all, all there is there. So how can we fix that? So let's try to approximate the spiral by using 
consecutive points here, two by two, right? So let's try to approximate this continuous manifold with some piecewise linear approximation. So that's going to be our goal, still with this sparse coding uh, thing. Okay. So from from here, we can basically again we were cleaning up the part below, and then we define this t as the top two components of this first z check. Okay. Z check was the minimizer of the energy, okay, and the energy is going to be the summation of the reconstruction error and this regularization term, okay. So in order to be uh, minimizing this term, you have to basically change this Z, right? But if you change Z too much, this term becomes large, okay. And so this term starts, you know, getting annoyed. And so when you minimize this overall energy, which is the sum of these two contribution, there's going to be a trade-off between getting a good prediction while having a Z that is not grown too much. Okay. What happens for this Z check uh, potentially, right? So potentially Z check could be very, very, very tiny, which is going to make this happy. But then this first reconstruction error might be very large unless a way that model has to cheat is going to be make W grow so much, right? This objective function, right? If you try to minimize this, this objective function, we would like to have a trade-off between these two things. But this doesn't happen if W is allowed to grow indiscriminately, right? Because this one tries to shrink down the Z, the latent variable. But then if there is no constraint over this guy, this W can just grow arbitrarily large. And then the cost overall is going to be unaffected. So the cost will be very good and you don't have any sparsity overall. Okay. So one thing that we have to do is also put a constraint over this W. Namely, we have to avoid this W to grow too much. So one way to do that is going to be make sure that the columns have unitary norm. So every time we're going to be updating this uh, W in the during learning, we also have to make sure that the norm of each of the columns is going to be unitary, such that they cannot change their size independently of what happens with Z and the, the cost. How can, how can we get to approximate that spiral by the, doing this kind of piecewise uh, linear uh, approximation? So after we find this Z check, which is a compromise between lowering the, you know, its length by reducing this R, but also compromising this other side, right? Where we try to get the prediction to be close to my target, right? So I get this Z check, which is going to be a compromise of a choice for the latent. T is going to be my two top components of this latent. Okay. So you can think about having the Z check and I mask everything but the two largest components, right? So I check my, my vector, which is going to be uh, likely a sparse vector. And I just take the two largest components and I zero out everything else. Next, I'm going to be now computing this secondary Z check minimizer, which is going to be uh, coming out from minimizing just the reconstruction error. Given that I provide just those two components inside the decoder. Okay. So here, instead of having my full white tilde that is coming from that uh, orange Z, orange pole Z, now I use this uh, minimization here. I minimize this cost between the target and the, you know, uh, chop, the chop version of the, of the Z check. Okay. And now I get this second Z check, which is going to be giving me the optimal, uh, what's called the relationship, right? the optimal quantities, right? The optimal value that the two components need to have in order to be um, giving me a perfect reconstruction. Okay. I would will choose now my loss, my per sample loss functional to be the classical free energy, right? So the classical energy loss, right? So no big deal, which is going to be the energy evaluated at the second uh, Z check, the one with only two components, the two optimal components, right? Okay. Okay. So if you do this and let's say you learn these kernels here, right? So these are going to be the columns of my decoder. Okay. 
these values here, the green values, these green dots, right, are going to be the columns of this matrix that we saw before. So this matrix here, we're going to be multiplying by Z. Z is going to be a vector that has everything zero but two components. Before we said, if Z was the one hot, you extract the single column, remember? In the k-means case. If the Z is going to be a one hot, you extract the corresponding column. You just extract the corresponding centroid. Now Z is going to be having two non-zero components. Okay? So far, we understand? Yes. I hope so, right? Okay. So this is going to be the top two components, and then I find the optimal to the two top two components. So what are the optimal two components for this location over here where I had the mouse? Okay. Top two are gonna is going to be giving me the top two components of the Z check. Okay. So Z check Z Z here is the original random variable here, the, the random random number. Then I find Z check, which is the one that gives me the minimum value that is a compromise between minimizing the reconstruction and minimizing the regularization. T masks everything but the top largest two components of this vector. So I enforce that this T is going to be a vector that has only two non-zero components. Okay, so it's like a hard, uh, hard min um, specification. Okay, then the top two optimum optimal values are going to be computed through this part over here. Okay. So in this case here, top two gives me the non, well, it zeroes out everything but the largest value. So that check is not one hot. No one said that, right? Uh, that was in the k-means, right? There, there is, Z is going to be a vector uh, in a, okay? So I guess next time I will start right here, uh, Z in a R whatever, right? Okay, so the, the point is that this sparsification tries to set components of the Z to zero, right? Many of them. That's what a sparse vector means. It's a vector with many, many zeros, right? And so the process, like the, the reason that we would like to have this R here, right, is that we'd like to have as many zeros as possible in this uh, latent variable such that we avoid having Y to be too freedom, to, to have too much freedom, right? Such that we have basically a collapse model. Okay, so let's figure now what are the two optimal, op optimal components of this Z check two, okay? So the two means also there are only two non-zero components, right? So again, if you multiply W by a vector, we said we're gonna get the scale version, the scale, scale summation of the columns of the matrix. Now we only have two values of Z that are non-zero. So the Y tilde is going to be the sum of two columns of the matrix appropriately scaled. Hmm? So let's figure now what is going to be those, what are going to be these two values, right? For this reconstruction over here. Let's say this is my first column, right? Of the, of the matrix. And this on top right here is going to be my second uh, column of the matrix. So what is going to be, what are the coefficients that you have to multiply these two columns in order to get this point over here? So if I want just this point over here, what are going to be the two coefficients? I want to reproduce this value over here. Can anyone tell me? One zero, exactly. Okay. So basically you're going to get the one hot vector and we're basically re recovering uh, k-means. Instead, how about this point here, which is 70% close to this location and 30% close to this location? Right, so 0.7 and 0.3, right? So 0.7 times this one plus 0.3 times this one, okay? And so you're gonna get this location over here. Okay, I think we, we understood this, right? So question for you now. How about a point that is moving along a parallel 
line that is, you know, just inside here. What is going to be this location here? What is going to be the component for this location? How about this thing here, right? So I'm trying to talk, tell you, right, about this parallel line that is closer now to the origin, right? So this point here on the top here, we were having point, uh, 0.7 and then point 0.3, right? And now simply if you want to have it shrunk, you can just scale down both values, right? So let's say point, uh, point 0.9 multiplied by point 0.7 and then point 0.9 multiplied by point 0.3, right? And so in this way, you can move down all the way and you're going to have a lower and lower energy as you move away from this side, which is not good. You understand what's happening? So if you do that, you're going to be ending up basically with something like this. As you move to downwards, right? If you move down this direction, you just need to scale down those coefficients and you're going to get a lower and lower energy. This is also not good, right? You, you understand what's happening? So now all points that are parallel to that one can be reconstructed by changing do, those two coefficients. Yes, we understand. No, we don't understand. I hope we understand. Okay. So how can we fix that? Right? So there is one more uh, trick to get this to actually work very nicely. And so the final trick is going to be the following, but isn't there a penalty for distance from the spiral? Uh, that's a good question, right? So the spiral is not there when you try to do inference, right? When you try to do inference, you try to reconstruct, let's say this point over here, where my tip of the arrow is, right? So the model will try to minimize the distance to this location I, I have, right? There is no spiral information in the model. Okay. The model will try to minimize the C and the R, right? For this location over here. And so the model will just scale down the, the, the coefficients inside the, the Z in order to minimize definitely C, but the C is going to be close to this target, right? The location that you try to uh, infer, right? Okay. Right. So the model will try to give you the energy associated to your specific location, but the model doesn't have a clue about where the spiral is, right? The model has this kind of cone. And as you go closer to the origin, you're going to be just simply lowering these two coefficients, which is going to be giving you the sum of the two coefficients is going to be actually the, the R, right? And so every point more or less will have, uh, a whatever fixed uh, C cost, right? And then you just small, like you reduce the Z as you move towards the center of the, of the, of the diagram. C would be zero actually, right? So if you, if you go down here, you, go, you manage to hit any location, right? So given two points, you can always hit a 2D point, right? On the screen. So given that I have two, two points, right? In the, unless they are aligned, right? If they are not aligned, you have two points, you can move them by scaling them. You're going to be hitting any point on the 2D space, right? So C is going to be fixed and equal zero everywhere. The only thing you are seeing here is going to be the R term, which is different for how far you are from the origin. You understand Joby? So it's actually a broken model. Okay. Very good. What are we predicting? Yeah. So here we are just estimating the free energy and the free energy. We wish it's going to reflect what is the closest distance to the manifold. But here it looks like the model has no clue where the manifold is. Okay. So we wish we would like to definitely tell how far you are from the, from the spiral, but it's not working as we expected. Right. So this took like a few months of my, my time to, to put together this, uh, this thing and nothing was working. And well, now I understand why, but I'm trying to explain to you why it was not working. Okay. Are we on the same page? Uh, require the weights to be zero one to fix the model. Um, so yeah, we have an issue with that. The, the columns now also, they have, they need to have unitary, uh, unit norm, right? I didn't show you that. So a lot of things are, you know, getting there to balance out. So let me show you how uh, we fix this problem. Okay. So to fix this problem, 
instead of having these two dimensional points, I will pretend they are two dimensional, but I, I add an extra dimension. What do I mean? I add a fixed value on top of each location. This means here that I'm going to define this Y dot, which is this augmented Y, which has a extra one on top of each 2D coordinate. OK, and so now these points are basically on a plane that is of uh, at height equal one. OK, and so now this one allows me to have some additional degree of freedom, because now these uh, columns right, of this matrix have three components. Now I have these uh, 50 points that have size of three. What happens now if I do exactly all the same is that points now need to be on that height, right? So you cannot uh, just try to intersect every point in the, in the 2D space. Now you're going to have to intersect the 2D points that are living on that specific height. And so this allows me to end up with this energy surface, okay? Only points that are connecting this first uh, element of the, of the dictionary and the other dictionary right over here will lie on the height at one, right? So there we have this zero energy level, okay? Written over here in dark, dark purple is zero. And otherwise, as you move away from this region, you're going to have that this energy uh, increases. The energy increases quadratically, right? Because the cost we said is the square Euclidean distance. But since all the values are very, very tiny, you wouldn't be able to see anything, right? It's very flat. So instead, uh, in order to make it less flat, right? Instead of having this very smooth parabola, I use a square root such that it becomes, it pops out. You can see better on the, on the screen, okay? That's why there is this cube value. Okay, we understand what's going on. Yes, no, I hope so, right? Okay, very good. So finally, we have a energy function here, which is the actual just reconstruction term, right? And the reconstruction term is going to be zero only along this, you know, uh, location over here. So on the outer rim, the approxima approximation are going to be um, tangential, right? They are like like tangential, tangential uh, approximation of the, of, the, of the spiral of the manifold. Whereas for, you know, whatever numerical reason, symmetric, symmetric, symmetric reason, the, uh, the approximation in the central part instead is going to be radial, right? So points that are happening here are going to be approximated along this dimension, right? This direction. Points that are happening here, they are located here, they are going to be oriented in this orientation and so on. Okay. So for each point here, this, this, this picture took like 20 minutes or 30 minutes to actually generate. Okay. With a, with a computer, because every location, you can see every pixel, every pixel is a full minimization process, right? So I trained the system with those 50 points that were augmented with the extra one on top. And then here I evaluate what is the reconstruction error for every location. I have 301 points times 301 points. It's like 90,000 uh, values in total. Questions so far. So these were the new, uh, new part, new, new lesson. As you can tell, I was a bit choppy, but I think we managed to get to the end of this new content, exclusive content for you only. <laughs> and everyone that is going to watch the recording. <laughs> Questions? Before I move on, right? Uh, what was the goal of sparsity coding? So sparse coding allows me to have a non-flat manifold, okay? If you don't have that additional term, like if you're in this case over here, right? If you don't measure the, the length of the, the Z, right? In terms of energy, then every location on this map here, on this picture, is going to have exactly zero energy, right? So if your model can reach every location of the space, then whenever you measure the distance between a specific location and the possible, like the, whether the model can reach it, if the model can reach it, you're going to have zero energy, right? 
you try a different location, the model can just reach it there. And then you have zero energy everywhere. So you don't anymore know whether a new point is on the manifold or off manifold if you always have a zero energy associated to it, right? Okay, so the objective, the, the, the what's called the, the, the target of this energy based model, right? The, 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 the way we try, we train them is going to be minimizing the loss in order to have a well behaved energy function. An energy function is well behaved if it assigns low energy for points coming from the data manifold, high, po high values to otherwise, right? If it assigns low values for every point, then it's going to be a useless model, right? If it tells you always, oh, the energy is zero, and then you are okay. And then now, if you say, if you see colors that are not just purple, that means that this model somehow tells you the allocation over here, it has a very high energy, right? So this is going to be a bad location. Although again, the model is not well trained, right? So or this model is not well behaved, right? Because it doesn't really necessarily assign a low energy to the points on the manifold. Okay. So sparsity was one way to restrict the degree of freedom, right? That this Z has. So we basically limit the volume that the model can assign low energy. Okay. One way to do that is going to be adding this penalty, uh, regularization term, which is penalizing large Z in the one, uh, in the one norm, right? Okay. Are we understanding? Okay. Other questions before I move on. Okay. Here's a question. A lot of this uh, model is not differentiable. How do you minimize it? Uh, everything was differentiable, right? I, I just did the first arg mean here by agreeing the same. Norm one is not differentiable. It's going to be just a constant gradient, right? What do you mean it's not differentiable? It has a kink for sure. So there are different ways, right, to compute the optimal uh, Z. I just use the standard gradient descent, like I've done for the other notebook. Another uh, better way, right, to, to actually uh, find a Z check would be to use ISTA, uh, iterative shrinking thresholding algorithm, okay? Uh, which is basically applying subgradients, yes, to minimize. Uh, it's going to be applying um, the one subgrade one gradient for the minimization of the uh, reconstruction error and then a subgradient for minimizing the uh, the norm the one norm of the latent okay like, this is becomes a little bit too technical i think we don't care so you can either use ista or you just apply gradient descent just everything works right uh, gradient descent just allows you to you know, you minimize the objective function by following subgradients, right? Anyway, moving forward, because it looks like everyone is not complaining. So from sparse coding, uh, we're going to be looking at something else, right? So same diagram, right here. So, but we can be talking about this target prop. What is target prop? many new things that you might not have heard before. Uh, target prop or target propagation uh, is the following. Okay, so we compute a Z tilde, right? So I have a green bold Z tilde. What is green? Remember, we started the lesson today by having definitions. What does green represent in our uh, drawings? Uh, it is not a latent state. Uh, it is a hidden state, right? And then we made very clear that hidden and latent are very different words in our field, right? Uh, latent is orange. Uh, hidden is green. Hidden means internal, right? That's another word for uh, hidden, whereas latent means missing, okay? So we may want to just talk about internal and missing variables, right? But the actual terminology is hidden and latent, but they are two different things. Anyway. I compute this Z tilde. What does tilde mean? Circa, right? More or less. A prediction. Estimation. Yes. And so this is coming from the encoder of Y. Oh, what is this enc? It's the first time we see encoder, right? We haven't seen an encoder so far. 
with me. Is it correct? Yes. Right? We never talk about encoders, remember? So far, all we have seen was decoder, as you can see here, or what was the other, uh, what was the other block? A predictor, right? So we either have a predictor when we go from X to Y's, right? Or we had a decoder, right? To go from the internal representation down to the, uh, or from latent representation to go down to the actual uh, ambient space. Okay, and today we're gonna be introducing this uh, new guy here, this encoder. Hmm, interesting, what does it do? Not much, it stays where it is, right? So Y stays in the, in the same space. Uh, but internal, it goes to internal space, right? So it's the opposite of the encoder. The encoder goes from, the decoder goes from this uh, hidden internal representation down to the ambient space. This encoder goes from the ambient space down up to the uh, internal representation. That's why you also the screen. All right, so there we go. So then we use this value I computed by feeding the encoder with my target. I use it for initializing the Z. Why do I do that, right? Because before, how was I initializing the Z? Randomly, right? I pick a random Z, and then we were doing the minimization to compute the free energy, right? Now, instead, I'm gonna be using this first module in order to be initializing what is gonna be the latent variable that I start my search for eventually, okay? Why is a check different from a hidden representation H? Hold on, Z check is blue, right? Z check is the optimal latent. Z, okay, we are gonna be making a lot of uh, confusion here. Z tilde, Z tilde is green. So what is the question? How is it different, right? Okay, I guess. Uh, how is it different from a hidden representation? That's the question. So if you have a tilde somewhere and you don't have the tilde on the other side, guess what's missing in the center? That's my question for you. Then you are, you're gonna get the answer. A, a spring, right? It's gonna be adding this spring here, I, I call it D, right? It's gonna be my cost D. I cannot call it C because a different letter, but okay. Still a cost, right? Anyway, and so now we're gonna be seeing that this spring doesn't let my Z fly too far from my Z tilde, right? Because this is actually a free variable, right? We're gonna be minimizing over. But on the other side, once I have the Z check here, I will actually try to get my Z tilde to be close to my Z check, right? Anyway, let's figure what's going on. So I compute my Z check by minimization of the energy, right? The sum energy is gonna be what? The energy is the, what is the energy in this system here? Tell me. <laughs> yeah, there you go. So the energy is gonna be the sum of all the boxes, right? As we have said plenty of times. So it's gonna be the C plus the R plus the D, okay? And so we're gonna be trying to minimize all the summation of these items here, starting from the initial location given to us by Z tilde for my orange Z, okay? Then I minimize this free energy, okay? I minimize the free energy, which is going to be the energy I get when I replace the, uh, the, the Z with the Z check, right? I, I skip a step, but you understand, right? So free energy is gonna be E at when you replace Z, the orange Z with the Z check, okay? So you're gonna have the R Z check, D Z check. And so what does this do? Well, how do we minimize this thing, right? So how do we minimize, let's say the C, right? The C term can be minimized by moving in the opposite direction of the gradient of the C with respect to the parameters of the decoder, right? So I update the weights of the decoder by moving towards the negative gradient of the final cost, right? The reconstruction cost with respect to the weights of the model, right? And then how do we minimize the, uh, this distance here? So this Y tilde is gonna be the output of, you know, feeding Z check, right? To the uh, decoder. 
how do I minimize this D term? Same with D and the parameters of the encoder. Okay, very good. So I will update the weights of the encoder by moving a little bit in the opposite di uh, direction of the gradient of this D term, right? Which is going to be a spring between my Z check and the Z tilde. The gradient of this thing with respect to the weights of the encoder. Interesting, okay. So you can tell now that this blue bold Y allowed me to compute Z check, right? Which is also blue, right? And now my blue bold Z check here acts as a target for my Z tilde, okay? So we have back propagated the target through the model, inside the model, okay? So now this missing variable that we had before, it's converted into a new target. Before we were, we had to compute a minimization every time we were performing inference, remember? Every time I had to compute that uh, F, I need to perform a minimization. And every time we were starting from a random point, now I can just have the benefit of starting in a nice initial uh, guess, right? What is this nice initial guess? Well, the, ini the initial guess is going to be provided to us by this Z tilde. And Z tilde is going to be an estimate for, finish my sentence. <laughs> if you are following. <laughs> Uh, okay, Let, let's try to put together the sentence again, okay? So before, when we were computing a Y tilde prediction, I had to minimize the cost, right, with respect to the latent in order to find a Z check. This minimization takes time, right, because it's a, we had to run gradient descent. Now, it's no longer needed because, oh, well, it's not going to be that expensive because the initial value for my Z, the orange bold Z, is going to be provided to me by Z tilde. Z tilde acts as an approximation for Z check, yeah? And how did we end up there? Well, we end up there because we are training the encoder to, that, to do that, okay? So answering the question uh, above. Not really following the difference between Z tilde and Z check, okay? So the encoder, Z tilde, it's green. Green means it's a hidden representation or internal representation, which is something that you compute yourself. I feed the Y, blue ball Y inside the encoder, the encoder spits out a green ball Z tilde, which is my internal representation for something, okay? We use this internal guess to initialize my random variable. Remember this latent variable, this missing variable. You have to, how do we find Z check? Z check is going to be the optimal value that allows me to minimize my energy overall, right? So whenever I have a target Y, I will minimize the, the energy to perform inference, right? With respect to the latent variable. The latent variable has to be initialized to something, right? You can choose a random value, you can choose zero, you can choose whatever you want, but then it's going to take many steps of gradient descent in order to minimize the energy to perform inference, right? Then we, we, we find, we go down the hill, right? We perform the minimization, we find Z check. Z check is the optimal latent. And now the interesting thing is that you train the encoder through the minimization of this spring, right? In order to try to get Z tilde, the initial guess, to be, to be as close as possible to my optimal value. You understand here? My Z tilde is my initial guess, right? The thing I use to initialize my latent. And then Z check is going to be, it's blue, means it's super cold. It is the lower energy latent variable associated to that specific blue ball Y. To that specific target, okay? So given a target, I have an energy function, an energy that is changing across all the Z. Remember in the, 
I show you 24 boxes in, in the last lesson, right? Uh, where we, I was showing you, right? Z was going from zero to, to, to pi, right? And then we had the U shape, the squiggly line and so on, right? So we have a energy function per each target I have, right? And then we also define that Z check is the lowest value that the energy takes, right? So I can just have the lowest value of this E here. Now that Z check is a, a outcome of a minimization process. This minimization takes time, takes computations. In order to speed up computations and well, in order to skip computation, well, in order to save time, we can start from a better initial location, right? Hmm? How to find a better initial location. So this was the initial location that was initially maybe not very good. Then we tried to get the encoder to come up with initializations, which are very close to that Z check, right? Z check was the optimal latent for that specific target. Now this encoder is fed with this Y and the encoder basically learns to predict what is the optimal latent, okay? So the optimal latent is Z check. We train the encoder to predict the Z check. Here you can see this, right? The encoder is trained to minimize the distance between its prediction and the optimal latent for that specific blue ball one. Are we okay? Other questions? Do you only minimize Z to find Z check during training or would you still use that to evaluate the model? I, I show you last Wednesday to perform inference, right? I uh, know whatever, whenever I was showing you the, the ellipse, how did we perform inference? Inference was estimating the free energy of a blue ball Y, right? The energy of the blue ball Y, right? In that ellipse case is going to be given to you by the shortest distance to find the shortest distance. I do, I need to find that check, right? So you definitely need to find, uh, the latent, the Z check to do inference, right? And the issue with the collapse model is the fact that you can, uh, find a Z check, which is giving you zero distance all the time. Right. Now I'm asking if the point of the encoder is to supplant, uh, yeah, well, you see that, right? So in, in this case, you try so you're using the encoder to speed up computations well to speed up time right because you're gonna be uh the second time around the second epoch you're gonna already have very good guesses right so you don't have to spend forever in uh, minimizing this thing because you're gonna be maybe requiring just a few steps of gradient descent to uh hit the, the z check right but you still want to use uh, the minimization, right? Because that's the actual Z check. Z check is the actual uh, minimizer. The encoder gives you an approximation for that. Maybe it's going to be a good encoder and maybe you just don't need to do any step. You reach already the minimum, right? Uh, you don't know. Just to make sure I understand Z check is sort of a target for a good initial guess of the latent. Yeah, yeah, definitely, right? So Z check is what we train the encoder to be able to predict, right? So this is the, uh, the distance factor, right? So Z check is fixed, right? The Z tilde is going to be a function of the weights of the encoder. We manipulate the weights, right? We are, we are adapting the weights in order to try to hit the, the target, right? So Z check is going to be my target for my Z tilde, right? And that's why it's called target propagation because, because we back propagated this target through the architecture. Okay. All right. So let's figure, um, when is this used, right? So let's, um, talk about, Ole, hold on one more question. Will you give an example of how to build this in PyTorch later? Uh, I, don't, I don't have it ready, uh, but it, which part? Okay. The minimization of the latent or what? Like wh which part is uh, hard to, to understand? Like which part are you referring to? Target, uh, target propagation is just adding one additional module, right? So you have 
two neural nets, you have a decoder and an encoder. And this is going to be one, you know, minimization. Uh, so you have first minimizer here, and then you use this value. Well, uh, let me think. Uh, I have this in the, in the notebook, so I can actually show you. Okay, maybe let's do that, right? Sure. Okay, I can do that, right? I didn't plan to, uh, but I, I, I should be able to, to pull it up. Okay, good, good question. Okay, it would be very helpful to see code for this. Yeah, okay, sure. I understand. You don't have to repeat yourself. Um, so going towards the code, I guess, uh, at this point, I'm going to let, let's have a more precise uh, implementation of this thing, right? So this is the generic case. Let's have a look at the uh, specific case, okay? So we're going to be talking about still um, sparse coding, but done in a different manner, right? So instead of using uh, the uh, regularizer, right, the R term, which had the uh, one norm of the latent, we're going to use something called, oh, okay, sorry, I, the animations are <laughs> broken, but okay. Uh, we are, we are, we're going to use something called uh, a nonlinear activation, right? So instead of using this R term over here, we're going to be using a sparsifier, okay? so instead of just having a soft constraint, I use some sort of harder constraint. We don't really care what's inside here, okay? I just, you know, use a nonlinearity that allows me to get this sparse uh, latent variable. At a higher level, can you describe a concrete example of where we would use a system like this? That's what I'm doing right now, right? Whenever you are using a latent variable energy-based model to perform inference, you need to perform a minimization, right? Minimization with respect to the latent in order to find this energy. This minimization takes time. If you use gradient descent, it takes several steps, right? Target propagation allows you to uh, to remove this kind of limitation, right? So so far, what we figure was that every time you had to run gradient descent, uh, full gradient descent, right? We had full gradient descent, you find the free energy, the closest distance, and then you try to minimize a little bit that one in one step of stochastic gradient descent, remember? So every, every training sample needs to go under, un, undergo a full minimization process, right? Each training sample, right? To find the correspondent latent variable, right? The optimal latent Z check, right? Given Z check, I can compute now the free energy. And now I can just do one step of stochastic gradient descent in the parameter space, okay? This, as you understand, may take a lot of time, right? So it's a really painful operation because you have to run an optimization process at every point in the training set, right? This is insane. So target prop comes in to rescue from this big issue. And it allows you, after a few uh, epochs, whenever the encoder starts catching up, to giving you uh, very good estimates for that uh, initial value of the Z, such that Z check compu the computation, computation of Z check doesn't require any more those many uh, operations, okay? That's the example at a higher level that you can understand in terms of concepts that we have covered so far. Then there is another explanation, which I can give you uh, in the future, which is seen from a other side, right? But I cannot tell you things from the future because that's not how you are supposed to learn, right? You're supposed to learn one way, <laughs> okay? Again, if you already know uh, these topics, then yes, I could say, but the other people in class might not know. So then doesn't, it's not fair to, to explain things from uh, knowledge that you are not uh, being given from this class, okay? All right, so one example that was going to be making these things more concrete was to use this uh, target propagation to train this uh, sparse, uh, sparse model, right? Whenever, instead of using this soft constraint, we use this sparse constraint, okay? So this sparse constraint basically gives me uh, a headache here because it's going to give me very, very little gradient here uh, coming back to modify this Z. Okay. Anyway, we can really speed up computations if you 
come up with a very good initial value. Okay? And I'm just repeating myself basically here. Okay. So sparsification means many zeros. Many zeros means there is no gradient coming back. A uh, very painful operation because again, this Z is not changing much at all, right? And given that you have very few uh, items are not non-zero, then it's very convenient to start from a location that is of advantage, right? Advantage location. Okay, good. Um, so let me show you how the outputs of this applying this model uh, look. Okay, so. I train the system on the same point. These dots here are going to be the columns of my uh, decoder, okay? In this case, they are not uh, necessarily of unit norm because there is no constraint that makes my Z small and try to push those uh, up, right? There's a like, nonlinear function that is just dropping to zero uh, many of the components of the Z. And this is how this uh, overall uh, spiral gets reconstructed, right? So the region inside these kind of cones looks like darker, right? Towards zero. Things that are outside these kind of cones, uh, I don't know if I want to call it cones or whatever, it looks like cones, right? So this looks like the intersection of many cones that are facing the basically origin somehow, or the, or the central of the, uh, of, the, of the spiral, okay? Uh, but then is it is this all dark? Let me zoom in and let me let me change the scale of the of the of the energy. Okay. And so here you can see that the inside of the spiral is actually non non-zero, right? It's around one. And then the only zero locations are going to be those around the outer rim, more or less. Okay. So only those points here along the outer rim uh, are given a low energy. Whereas everything else inside this uh, part has a unitary, more or less, unit of 1.5, I believe, energy. And then everything outside this spiral gets a very high energy very quickly, okay? And then you wanted to check the notebook. So let's check the notebook. Again, this is going to be, uh, I don't know if it's going to work, right? Uh, this card, because I didn't even try. But why not? Let's see whether we can improvise right so we go on work github um, book uh, git uh, restore backprop okay uh, git pull conda activate book jupyter lab so Let's have a look at the uh, target propagation, okay? So here I have my model, which is a sparse coder and whatever, and that has this, um, I can sample my latent, I can update some sort of internal sparsifier or something. Then there is the sparsification item turns my Z into zeros and ones and most of the time it's going to be zeros okay so it makes it between zero and one and then most of the items are going to be uh, shrunk down to zero then there is this decoder which is simply sending maybe i should zoom a little bit right uh, i have this decoder which is fed with the latent variable right as we said before so z uh, the decoder is defined here the decoder goes from D, which is 20 dimensions. So I have 20 columns in my uh, matrix, and then I have three rows, right? Again, we are using this kind of additional one on top of the spiral. And the encoder instead goes the other way around. It goes from three, that are these uh, locations, the Y location, and then they go into this 20 dimensional uh, hidden representation, okay? Uh, yes, I use Greek letters in the code, right? So if you want to write, let's say, sigma, right? You do backslash C, sigma, right? And then I press slash uh, tab, right? Or if you want beta, beta, tab. Or if you want theta, tab, right? Uh, this is very convenient whenever I uh, write mathematics, right? If I had to use English to, to convert the, the symbols, I, I, I go a little crazy. This is not yet code, right? This is notebooks, right? So I wouldn't call notebooks code. Code notebooks are some sort of hybrid, right? So 
Yes, use uh, Greek. I use Greek in 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 the notebooks. No, I don't use Greek in code. Right. Anyway, uh, so far all good, right? We don't have any crazy thing. Here. Um, let's move on. So we are interested in the uh, training this thing, right? So we define a few things, right? So we have that the energy is going to be uh, remember the sum of the So the energy in this case, there is no longer the R, right? The energy is going to be the summation of C and D, right? Because we swap the R for this sparsification nonlinear function. Okay, so we have this Y minus net decode sparsified latent, right? And then I, I, I square, I square this difference, right? And I take the sum. As you can tell, this is, what term is this? This one I show you right now. Can you tell me? This is the C, right? The Y minus Y tilde, correct, right? And then the other uh, term here, Z minus Z zero uh, square and then summation, this is going to be what? The D term, right? Okay. And Z zero is going to be uh, Z tilde in this case, right? The initial value, but I also can have Z tilde, but I don't remember anymore why I didn't use the term. Okay, so let's see, let's see. Ba, 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 train. We just use a optimizer, Adam, for training the dictionaries. Um, I have some buffers for for you know logging the the training loss, the batch loss, and so on. I also have some initial value for the best loss so that I can save, I can do early stopping, and so on. Here you have this dummy data, data, right? So the dummy data has this bunch of ones on top of the Y, right? So I augment my Ys, those points in the ellipse, by a bunch of ones. And so the training part is gonna be the following, okay? So here we have the full thing. First, I'm gonna be getting my Z tilde. It's going to be sampling a latent variable, right? Oh, uh, hold on, Z tilde. Simple latent Y. What is this doing? Mm, I see. Ah, okay, because I should have changed the name. Ah, okay. See, I was not preparing. Uh, I was not prepared for teaching this. So what is the um, sampling thing doing? Where is it? So simple latent, if I provide a Y, so if Y is not none, so if I provide a Y, then simply, uh, encode the Y, right? If one is not is none, so I, if I don't provide the actual uh, the actual target, then I just return a random uh, a random Z, right? You see this, right? So this is going to be allowing me to do the the two uh, the two different things, right? In one case, I can sample a latent given that I provide a Y. In the other case, I have the uh, the latent when I don't provide a Y, right? So one is a conditional sampling, the other one is going to be unconditional sampling, right? But I could have simply uh, used, in this case, the self-encode, right? So if Y is not none, then Z, which is going to be the Z tilde, right? is going to be the encoded version of the Y. You see this, right? So here we have the following, right? So Z tilde, it's basically encode, right? So we can just do encode, uh, encode Y. Then I say Z zero, which is going to be my initialization. I just detach this thing, right? Why do I detach? Can, can anyone tell me? What would happen if I don't detach the Z tilde? So whenever we compute uh, later on, there's going to be some backward, right? Whenever you compute backward, what happens? Backward goes in the opposite, opposite direction of the forward pass, right? Now, whenever we do back propagation with respect to the latent variable, right? You want to change the latent variable. You don't want to change the encoder, right? So if you run, if you run back propagation twice, right? You're going to be uh, getting into trouble, right? Because 
you just forward once through the encoder, but then as you run back propagation multiple times, you haven't run forward propagation inside the, uh, for the encoder, right? Again, this is maybe too advanced, I don't know. Uh, anyway, we detach the Z tilde such that the, um, the, the autograd doesn't go back inside the encoder when we are going to be minimizing the energy with respect to the latent variable, right? Then I compute Z check. How do we compute Z check? Well, Z check is going to be this, this compute Z check, which is simply uh, gradient descent. Let me check. Let, let's go see how, what is that uh, compute Z check. So compute Z check, right? It's here. It's running LBFGS over this energy, okay? And LBFGS is simply this function over here where I just use this, uh, you know, gradient descent algorithm using perhaps strong wolf to minimize the energy by changing the latent value, right? So this is full, this is a full uh, optimization loop, right? Whenever you, you run this thing here, you're going to be just minimizing the whole thing, right? So whenever you do opt step, this one goes down the, uh, the, gra the, down the gradient, right? To minimize this E function, given that it has the input, right? The input was that Z tilde initialization. Okay. All right, let's go down here. So here we have this compute Z check, which is a full gradient descent minimization of the energy E, given that we start at Z zero, right? And Z zero is going to be my detached Z tilde, right? So Z tilde is still attached. Z zero is the detached version of the Z tilde. If you run, if you don't have the detached part, when you run this compute, it's going to break because whenever you have this back propagation here, you saw here, right? There's back propagation inside here. This back propagation will try to go inside the encoder. And the first time is fine. The second time it goes through the encoder, it's going to break, right? Because we haven't run forward uh, multiple times, right? There, okay? I hope you're following. Um, so here we uh, compute Z check by minimizing the energy by and, and having an initial value set to that Z tilde, right? Then we say that Z0 is Z tilde, so I reconnect the computational graph. And now I can compute the free energy, being the energy E, right, the summation of those two blocks, at the Z check location, which is what we were saying before, right? Then I say I use the energy loss. My loss is going to be equal the energy. I0, the previous gradient. And I run back propagation. Now we're going to be running back propagation given that I have found the optimal Z check, right? And so my back propagation flows backward. Let's go back to the slides, right? So I found my Z check, right? I, I compute the Z tilde. I call my Z initial Z, Z0, the detached version of Z uh, tilde, right? Such that when I perform back propagation here, right? To find the, uh, when, I, when I minimize this thing over here, right? I go here and I do this minimization. Ooh. I minimize this cost by minimizing. So I minimize this cost by changing Z and I don't have any uh, arrow going down here, right? That's why there is the detach. So I block this path over here. Finally, when I found the Z check, right? When I find the Z check, I reconnect, I reconnect the path here, right? So I used again that Z tilde over there, such that I can minimize both these Ds, right? I can minimize this loss, the loss, the free energy, uh, the energy loss, right? And we minimize this by gradient descent, right? Or by having, you know, by using a backprop uh, to compute these things, and then we perform the gradient descent, right? You see? So once again, let's, let's repeat what's going on here. I have my initial Z tilde, which is going to be the encoded target. Okay. 
Then I have Z0, which is going to be the detached version of the, uh, of the Z tilde, such that I don't have gradients flowing backward inside the encoder. Then I compute the optimal Z check by running full gradient descent. In that case, I use LBFGS with, you know, strong wolf, but we don't care. Then I reconnect my uh, Z tilde, right? So I have that Z0 is going to be Z tilde. And then I finally compute this free energy, right? Which is going to be feeding the uh, Z check inside this energy. And then I have the loss by choice is going to be the free, the energy itself. And then finally, the whole steps, right? We have the zero of the gradient, uh, back propagation to compute the partial derivatives, right? And then I follow the negative uh, direction, right? That's it. The, this other stuff is for logging. Okay. Questions? Why is reconnecting? Why <laughs> connecting? Uh, yeah, yeah, I know. Uh, yes, a good question. Uh, because, 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 because here. The E has this Z0, right? So Z0 is what comes inside uh, this D expression, right? So initially, that Z0 is the detached uh, version. And now, since I want to still have the gradients, right, I need to put back in place here my Z tilde. So I had to call Z0 Z tilde such that when I minimize this D term, this thing sends me gradients back in the encoder, right? I know it's a bit, uh, I didn't tell you, but you found out and now I told you. More questions? Otherwise, I start talking about more things. Are we good, right? I show you here the example. Then if we train this stuff, you're going to get the exact same uh, drawings I showed you before, okay? Good question, Patrick, though. Are we good? Yes? No? Is everyone still alive? <laughs> Okay, someone is oh, fine. Okay, 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 okay. This is going to be the introduction for tomorrow, uh, tomorrow class. Okay. So this is the generic version of target propagation where we were uh, speeding up the overall process by, you know, using this. Uh, the notebook is no, it's not. The notebook is going to be available on the book. Okay. Uh, it's not yet ready for people. If in fact you saw it, there were mistakes, right? So that notebook is again. You can watch the video, but it's not runnable yet. It's work in progress. Uh, so we, we saw here that, again, just wait, wait one month, you're going to have the notebook, okay? It's not going to be necessary for solving your homework right now. The point here was to use this encoder to speed up the um, minimization process, right? To compute the Z check, right? By having this good initial guess. But then, can we simplify things? Can we put all, uh, like, can we, can we do something else? Right? So this is just the beginning of the new chapter, which is going to be, uh, reserved for tomorrow, but it starts this way. Okay. So we first clean up the screen. We clear up the initialization. We remove the spring. We remove also the latent variable. And then we, remove the prediction. And someone mentioned before, right? How is that Z tilde different from our internal representation? That is exactly what we are going to be doing here. And so I'm going to be just having the encoder feeding the internal hidden representation to the decoder. Okay. So one important uh, definition that I didn't tell you, the task that we were asking the encoder before, right? In this case, here, the encoder is said to perform amortized inference. Okay. So how are we performing inference in an energy base, a latent variable energy base model? Answer in the chat. How do we perform inference in a latent variable energy base model? Type in the chat, type in the chat. 
minimize the energy as a function of the length. Perfect. Okay. Now we can actually get a bypass this minimization by using a approximate uh, solution, right? It's called, a, it's going to be approximate inference, right? And this is actually called amortized inference is when you use the uh, neural network and not your neural network, in this case, the encoder to perform the, uh, you know, to, to predict what is going to be the output of a minimization process, right? Similarly, I would say also the decoder does that. The decoder is trained to provide, you know, the output of a minimization process, which is the minimization we apply uh, to reduce the loss, right? So I would even say, uh, and I should be correct, right? That the decoder is also somehow performing amortizing inference where the prediction is going to be like, you know, the minimization process, the actual training process. But again, there's a little bit too much meta. In this case, it's like more uh, concrete, right? So this encoder is going to be performing this amortizing inference, uh, important term. But then we said we can skip a few steps, remove the latent, remove the spring, and then pop that kind of uh, Z tilde up there, right? So we replace a spring now with a wire, okay? So the spring is like a, a you know, how do you call it? A, a giving uh, constraint, right? It's like a soft constraint. You try to get your Z tilde to be kind of, kind of close to the Z check, right? Now instead you put a wire, pam, okay? So here the H is going to be, uh, as you can tell from the, from the picture, right? The output of the encoder, right? Which is fed with a Y. And then the Y tilde is going to be the same, uh, the, the decoder of H, okay? So what is called an architecture that is encoding its own input. Oh, no, no. Yes, Patrick and, and, and some Sumanyu are correct, right? This is the beginning of the autoencoder chapter of our course, okay? So that, that's pretty much it, right? So we came to uh, the beginning of the lesson that, you know, it used to be the beginning of the lesson, but we talk about many other things today, which is the, the, the lesson about autoencoders, which are simply one step further from target propagation and target propagation was, tell me what is target propagation? So what are the logical steps? First, we start with what is the basic component we start the class with? Type in the chat such that we can finish the lesson. We started with what is the basic thing we start today class with? <laughs> the first thing we talk about, and K-means is one uh, representative, was the latent variable energy-based model, okay? So that was the minimal example of a generative model, okay? Then from this latent variable energy-based model, we went a step forward and we learned that target propagation allows us to spare computation and speed up training, right? Or even inference, if you want. Actually, you speed up inference and therefore training, okay? Third point, we see now how replacing a soft constraint, like that kind of soft spring D with a wire brings us to the, to the plane, to the table, now the autoencoders, right? So everything is just an energy-based model, right? So that's why it's so pretty. Uh, this energy stuff, because everything is just an energy based model. Just you had to look at it from the right angle, from the right light. Anyway, thank you again for being with me. We went uh, just through the, the, the whole content. You know, it was a bit choppy, but that's what you get when, you know, you listen for the first time to content I haven't really uh, tried out before. But, you know, apologies. But also thank you for being uh, my, my guinea pig, right? I'll see you tomorrow for the next part of the class with autoencoders. Okay. Bye bye. See you tomorrow.